You know, so much of the way that we conceptualize meaning and happiness and fulfillment, it is through this American and westernized lens. You know, we can't help but think about it in, through those frameworks. But I'm wondering, for the three of you, are there any other cultures that you look to outside of our own, particularly right now, for some guidance or for some universal truth in finding meaning and happiness? Are there other parts of the world that you're looking to for this stuff besides somewhere in the U.S. right now? And we'll start with, with Lori. Yeah, well, definitely, in part because, you know, empirically speaking, the U.S. is not doing so awesome when it comes to happiness. <laughs> you know, we're a very wealthy nation, but we're also a very unequal nation. And for our wealth, we're a relatively unhappy nation. And so, you know, I encourage everyone to check out the World Happiness Report. This is a yes. report that the United Nations puts out every year where they really rank order cultures in terms of their happiness. And, you know, you probably can guess it tends to be the kind of Danish countries that overall are a little bit happier. But they're happier not because, you know, there's something like genetically built into, you know, those cultures that make them, you know, improved, have improved well-being over time. You know, the research really shows that they're happier in part because of their practices. You know, these are practices, these are, these are cultures where social connection is really at the fore, where exercise and movement is at the forefront, you know, where there's a lot of community building and pro-social behavior, altruism, a lot of savoring and gratitude. You know, these are the cultures of like Hugo, when you have the, you know, hot chocolate and the warm blanket, and even though it's dark and yucky out, you kind of enjoy yourselves. And I think, you know, there's really something that we can learn from the cultures that are doing it well. But, but these days, actually, my favorite place to go for inspiration about happiness isn't, you know, changing cultures, but it's actually changing time. You know, I'm running a, a season of my podcast right now called Happiness Lessons of the Ancients, where we go back to all these ancient traditions that we can kind of poo-poo because we say, oh, we have modern neuroscience and psychotherapy and, you know, modern behavioral stuff. We forget that the ancients had a lot right, and we can actually look to them to for, for lots of wisdom. These days, I'm very obsessed uh, with the Stoics, who get a kind of bad rap. People think Stoics were kind of not emotional, and they didn't like, you know, like kind of being in the moment and things. But the Stoics were really into emotions. They just liked positive emotions. They really wanted you to, you know, recognize when you had a negative emotion and just kind of decide that you didn't want to feel that way anymore and sort of do these practices that kind of got you out of it. So, so I think we can look to other cultures for inspiration, but I think we can also look to the ancients and to other times for inspiration too. I like that. So like the same question to you, are there other cultures or places around the world that you're looking to right now when you think about finding happiness and meaning and fulfillment? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, so my father is Tunisian and that's where I lived when I was little and I've been thinking about uh, certain things that my family in Tunisia do so naturally that uh, here in the U.S. we don't do naturally at all. Um, and one of them is um, the idea of community, but not in terms of having a giant community and having many acquaintances and having lots of s socializing, uh, but these small, tight-knit communities uh, that, at least in the town where my dad is from, it's really neighborhood-based. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, Middle Eastern hospitality or North African hospitality, but where your uh, initial participation in that small, tight-knit community is one of service and initial generosity. So you're not, you know, calling on someone and expecting them to be there when you haven't already existed within that community as someone who is giving and um, supporting uh, other people within that, that community. And I think about this last year where, you know, for me, my world has narrowed and dwindled pretty dramatically. I see my dogs, I see my partner, and I have three other humans in my corn pod. And those are the only people I've seen in person for the last year. Uh, and there's been something really kind of beautiful and magical about that, which is that we don't catch up uh, because we see each other all the time. Um, and there's an intimacy, um, I think, when you're not you know, constantly going out for a coffee or for a lunch or for a drink with a new person. And by the time you reach the end of the month, you have to start that cycle all over again. Um, that comes when we, when we actually kind of narrow our, our uh, who, who we see consistently 
and um, and how we conceive of that community. Right. And for us there, are there other cultures or places in the world that you're looking to right now when you think about fulfillment and happiness and meaning, particularly for relationships? Well, I was thinking, you know, I, because I work primarily with couples and I work all over the world with couples and I need to understand locally in each place where I am, what are the expectations of relationship? What is the definition of a good relationship, of a happy marriage, of a happy family? And um, I think that there are clear distinctions. You know, um, if we go on a Maslow ladder, you know, there is a definition of happiness that really identifies itself with the ability to satisfy the basic human needs of shelter, of health, of longevity, of security. There is a second level, I'm going to do this very uh, um, simplified, you know, that involves um, the notion of happiness as it involves a sense of belonging, a sense of community, and everything that Suleika just emphasized. It's not you meet people in order to go and talk about your life, it's you live with people. And therefore, you don't need to talk about it, because we experienced it together. And therefore, you also have a different sense of relevance and of being helpful to others. And that's probably one of the most important ingredients to happiness, which I wish to, I had mentioned it in your previous question. So... And then there is the next level of, of happy relationships. This is the research of Eli Finkel that looks at, you know, the identity model of relationship where we no longer just want romance and belonging and community and even a best friend. Now I want you to help me become the best version of myself. That's the identity notion. So happiness in relationships in modern love has really gone to that level. It also mirrors the fact that people often will mate 10 years later than we used to do just in the 1960s. Our own culture has changed as well. It's not just that we need to compare ourselves with other cultures.